Unexpected Elements is all about finding the surprising science angles to everyday news. Mind absolutely blown. Amazing to me. That's Unexpected Elements from the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your BBC podcasts. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Janet Jalil, and in the early hours of Wednesday, the 1st of November, these are our main stories. Israel says it's killed a Hamas commander in Gaza's largest refugee camp, where airstrikes have reportedly left dozens of civilians dead. In Britain... There was effectively no plans or any plan even to get a plan. An inquiry into its handling of the COVID pandemic hears scathing evidence from close aides to the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Pakistan's Human Rights Commission warns of a looming humanitarian crisis as a deadline approaches for undocumented Afghans to leave the country. Also in this podcast... You ain't going to hit me again. We're not going to go for a second take, are we? I said, I think that one didn't work the first time. (laughs) How accents in England are changing. A huge explosion at Gaza's largest refugee camp is reported to have killed dozens of people and wounded many more. The Israeli military confirmed it had carried out airstrikes on the Jabalia refugee camp to eliminate one of the commanders behind the Hamas attack on October the 7th. Daniel Hagari is a spokesman for the Israel Defense Forces. The strike on Ibrahim Biari caused the collapse of many structures there because there was a wide underground network in Jabala, which is used for conducting terror attacks against our troops. All the infrastructure collapsed and many terrorists were killed. The Jabalia refugee camp is an area that Israel has declared an evacuation zone, but many Palestinian civilians have refused to flee their homes. Footage from the scene shows people pulling bodies from the rubble in the middle of a massive crater. Our correspondent in Jerusalem, Paul Adams, sent this report on the attack. The images from Jabalia are shocking. A vast crater surrounded by rubble and shattered buildings and hundreds of people searching the wreckage where the dead and the terribly injured lie, waiting to be recovered. (laughs) We're filling bags with children, he cries. We're placing them in bags. <laughs> Seated amid the rubble, a boy and girl cry out for their father. Local journalists said they counted at least 47 bodies after an airstrike that demolished several houses in this, the largest of the Gaza Strip's eight refugee camps. Outside the nearby Indonesia hospital, a long line of body bags. Some say the number of dead could be much higher. Inside, wards and corridors are packed with the injured. A doctor, Sueb Ides, trying desperately to cope. Large number of injured has come to us after the large explosion that shook the entire Jabalia refugee camp. Hundreds of injuries. They were just in their homes. They were targeted while they were in their homes. Children, women, elderly. We have no idea what to do. There are injured everywhere. This was a huge explosion, a vast column of black smoke clearly visible from inside Israel at about the time the first chaotic reports came in. One weapons expert asked about the crater, said it was consistent with the sorts of bombs the Israeli Air Force is using to hit targets buried deep underground. Israel said it had carried out a wide-scale strike on what it called underground terror infrastructure embedded beneath buildings. It said the strike had killed a Hamas commander and a large number of his men. But Palestinian groups, including Hamas, are still firing rockets into Israel. Less than 20 miles from Gaza, in the coastal city of Ashdod, four people were wounded in two separate attacks. Paul Adams. As the war in Gaza has raged, we've talked about the millions of Palestinians trapped there who are under constant bombardment. The Hamas-run health ministry says more than 8,500 people have been killed in the past three and a half weeks. This is the story of just one man, Khalil Kada, a father who lost all his children in an airstrike, as told to BBC journalist Mahmoud Bassam in Gaza. Foreign journalists are not allowed to enter Gaza, so Fergal Keane has sent us this report from Jerusalem. You may find it distressing. Khalil Kada walks alone. The four children who might have played and danced along the road beside him are dead. 
Up ahead is the mound of rubble where his house once stood and where 11 members of his family were killed over a week ago. The house is next to Al Najjar Hospital in Rafa, where every day of this war the staff received the wounded and the dead, and where Khalil Kader was working the night his family became casualties. A massive bomb exploded that night, he tells us, standing on broken concrete and twisted metal. And my neighbours started showing up at the hospital. So I asked, where was the bombing? And they told me it was around my house. I had to run to the house to check on the family. I tried calling, but no one was answering. And as you can see, the whole house was bombed. Dug from the rubble, dead. His 70-year-old father, his two sisters, his brother, his brother's wife, their two daughters, and his four children. Ibrahim, nine years old, Amal, five... Kinan, two and a half, and Rosa, 18 months. As he walks, he picks out fragments of a life that no longer exists. Some blue fabric catches his eye. A pyjama set baby Rosa wore in the days before the bombing. He shows us a slow-motion video of Rosa in the blue pyjamas, dancing with her cousins. They sway gently, smiling through an afternoon from another time. Another video, four cousins on a swing. Khalil had known war before in Gaza and worried about raising a family here. Yet Ibrahim, Amal, Kinan and Rosa were born to a couple who dreamed that their children would know a better life. I remember in the 2014 war my wife was pregnant and our neighbours were bombed. She was in her seventh month and almost fell down the stairs from the blast. And I thought to myself, how can I bring children into this life? I had a dream for each of my kids. Ibrahim was first in his school and I dreamed of seeing him as a doctor one day. Amal was very creative. She loved drawing. And she used to show me her drawings and sometimes I would draw with her. Kanan was very playful. Everyone loved him, and he used to take care of his little sister. He was always there to protect Rosa, and would say, don't touch her, she's my baby. And now they are all gone. That report by Fergal Keane. The UN's children's agency, UNICEF, has warned that the constant bombardment will cause Gaza's young population to suffer generational trauma. James Elder is a UNICEF spokesperson. Like many others, we have pleaded for the killing of children to stop. Now, our gravest fears about the reported numbers of children killed, going from dozens into hundreds into thousands, have been realised in just a fortnight. The numbers are appalling. Reportedly now more than 3,450 children have been killed. Staggeringly, this number rises significantly every single day. Gaza has become a graveyard for children. The Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, has strongly defended the military operations in Gaza, insisting Israel is doing its best to limit civilian casualties. He said it had to target Hamas's infrastructure, including homes, because the group was using them to launch rockets. President Herzog was speaking to our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, in Jerusalem. As Israel intensifies its military operations in Gaza, the number of civilian deaths keeps rising, including thousands of children. President Herzog said no one wanted innocent Gazans to pay a price, but he insisted that Israel had a right to defend itself. Missiles fly on us to kill us. What am I supposed to do by the right of first self-defense? I have to eradicate the infrastructure that launches the missiles. More than 8,000 dead. And last night we heard nearly 70% are women and children. So why Why have women. they had to pay the price? Go- well, nobody oh, wants them to pay the price. God forbid. My heart goes out truly. But when you dis- deal with the right of self-defense, what kind of self-defense do I have when people went in to our territory? Mr. Herzog said Israel was urging civilians to move to southern Gaza for their safety. 
He rejected UN warnings that no part of Gaza was now safe. The president kept returning to the same point, that after Hamas's atrocities in southern Israel on October 7th, Israel, he said, was a different nation in unprecedented agony. He dismissed warnings even from Israel's closest allies that its military operations could create even more danger for Israel. Lise Doucette reporting. Police in New York say they're questioning a person about anti-Semitic threats to Jewish students at Cornell University. Over the weekend, posts that used slurs and threatened a mass shooting on campus appeared online. The FBI is treating the incident as a potential hate crime. Neda Torfik reports. No further information was released about the person of interest or the investigation from either Cornell University, the police, or New York's governor, Kathy Hochul, who on Monday visited students and assured them the state was taking the threat seriously. In a statement, she said the individual was currently in custody for questioning and that she was committed to combating hate and bias. The Ivy League school has heightened security at its Jewish center. The Biden administration announced yesterday new measures including sending cybersecurity experts to schools to combat a sharp rise in anti-Semitic and Islamophobic incidents on campuses. Neda Torfik. Anti-war protesters have repeatedly interrupted a hearing on U.S. military aid at the Congress building in Washington. The group raised hands covered with red paint and shouted during the Senate hearing as the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, made the case for more funds to support Israel and Ukraine. From Washington, here's our correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue. We Around two dozen protesters, their hands daubed in red paint, stood up during the hearing calling for a ceasefire in Gaza before being dragged out. Secretary of State Tony Blinken acknowledged what he called the passions in the room but said it was imperative for the US to back its ally Israel. Mr Blinken was also asked about humanitarian aid for Gaza and whether $9 billion designated for the conflict would all end up in the hands of people who needed it rather than being siphoned off by Hamas. There will inevitably be some spillage. We haven't seen it to date, but I think we have to anticipate that. But the overwhelming majority of the assistance thus far is getting to people who need it, and we need more. On top of the humanitarian aid, the administration is asking for $14 billion of extra security funding for Tel Aviv, as well as $61 billion for Ukraine. But some elements in the Republican Party, opposed to more money for Ukraine, want the issues separated, setting up a congressional battle in the coming days. Gary O'Donoghue. Meanwhile, the US said on Tuesday that another 66 aid trucks had entered Gaza over the last 24 hours, the largest delivery in a single day so far since Israel imposed its siege on Gaza. The White House National Security Spokesman, John Kirby, said food, water and medicine were allowed through, but he said the needs remained huge and more deliveries were planned. It's the highest single day delivery so far. But again, it's a trickle compared to what needs to get in, and we're going to keep working that uh, very, very hard. Dozens of more trucks are expected to clear. We're obviously uh, watching this as closely as we can, and we hope that they all get in. The authorities in Egypt have said they will take in about 80 severely injured Palestinians so they can be treated in Egyptian hospitals. While international attention has been focused on Gaza, concerns are growing about the other Palestinian territory, the occupied West Bank. The Shin Bet Security Service is reported to have warned the Israeli government that violence could erupt there as clashes between settlers and Palestinians have increased. The UN's humanitarian office says violence by Israeli settlers in the West Bank has risen since the Hamas attack. It's recorded more than 170 attacks by settlers during that period. The violence has led to the deaths of at least 120 Palestinians. One Israeli soldier has also been killed. The U.S. has called on Israel to protect the Palestinians living in the West Bank from militant settlers, as the White House spokesman, John Kirby, explained. The president spoke to this himself, specifically talking about how dangerous it is that extremists in the West Bank are killing innocent Palestinians, and it's got to stop. It's deeply concerning. Each and every one of them is a tragedy, too. Roy Yellen is a spokesperson for Bethlehem, an Israeli organization which monitors human rights violations committed by Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory. Evan Davis asked him what's been going on in the West Bank over the last three weeks. 
Since October 7th, we are documenting an unprecedented uptick in settler violence events in the West Bank, all over the West Bank, but particularly in uh, the most vulnerable herding communities where uh, the, this pressure is really helping Israel achieve goal of uh, forcibly displacing those communities from their homes and taking over their lands. When you say you're documenting a rise in settler violence, can you give me an example of what you mean, what we're talking about, what form this violence takes? So anything that from threatening people, by, from burying their access to their land, to destruction of their property, cutting down their olive trees or hurting their cattle, including physical violence against those Palestinians. And we also documented incidents in the past three weeks where Palestinian farmers were shot, shot to death by settlers. Killed by by settlers. C can I ask, yes. is there a judicial process that would bear out these reports? I mean, I've seen things on social media and one never knows quite what to uh, believe or what the full story was. What is happening in these cases? Because you're presumably reporting them or they are reported. They are reported, but the Israeli policy for many years, for dozens of years, is actually to ignore and to provide settlers with impunity from justice. This is why we are not looking at settler violence as something that is coming from, from the ground, from the field, from below. It is actually sanctioned by the Israeli government, and it just serves as another mean of taking over Palestinian land, in addition to other more formal means, like uh, bureaucratic means, restrictions on, of movement, barring Palestinians from accessing very basic infrastructure like electricity and water, not providing them with building permits, forcing them to build illegally and then demolishing their homes. And in general, this policy is aimed in creating what is termed in international law as a coercive environment. Roy, to what extent would the government accept the narrative that you've just you've just given me? Would they accept that they're not really trying to stop settler violence against Palestinians? Or would they say that these are skirmishes that are occurring with provocations on both sides and, and, and that they're not getting drawn in. I just, I'm trying to get my head around what, what they would say to what you're telling me. This government, it would be like a little bit too little too late with anything they might say, because it's actually very, they have very public expressions of support for this type of violence. We had in the beginning, on the very, very first month for this government being in office, the Minister of Finance said to wipe out an entire Palestinian city, Hawara, in the context of a pogrom that you know, hundreds of settlers committed there. So this is not, you know, thinking in a conspiratorial way. There are very, very clear expression of support for this policy. What do ordinary Israelis, and I know that Israel is, the Jewish communities of Israel are not all one and they're not all identical in their thinking, of course, but what do other Israelis think of your group and what you're, and what you're telling us, Roy? Well, I think we're not Miss Popular now because, of course, there's a lot of anger towards Palestinians in general in Israeli society. We've just, or we're still actually, experiencing atrocious war crimes committed against us by Hamas and other groups of militant Palestinians from Gaza that entered Israel and committed the most horrible crimes. And as a group that advocates for the rights of, of Palestinians, of course, we are not the most popular. That said, I, I think that uh, most Israelis are definitely opposing the settler violence and what goes on in the West Bank. They don't support it in any way. Roy Yellen, a spokesman for Bethlehem. Still to come on the podcast. If you thought the Winter World Cup in Qatar was a one off, then think again. Saudi Arabia is on course to host the 2034 men's football tournament after Australia says it won't bid. Amazing sports stories. How exactly do you survive a race that's deliberately designed to break you physically, mentally and emotionally? It's about the risk takers. I decided to climb the Himalayas, all 14 picks. And the game changers. I want to play like my brother. I want what he has. Amazing sports stories from the BBC World Service. The rules were holding her back. 
So she would have to rewrite them. Search for amazing sports stories wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. The Human Rights Commission of Pakistan has warned that the forced expulsion of hundreds of thousands of undocumented migrants, mostly Afghans, could trigger a humanitarian crisis. It said the decision by the Pakistani government amounted to forced repatriation. The Human Rights Commission said people needed a chance to obtain legal papers. It had urged the UN to persuade the government to extend the 1st of November deadline for migrants to leave Pakistan voluntarily. Thousands of Afghans have rushed to the border ahead of the cut-off date. An estimated 1.7 million people are facing expulsion. One migrant, Sara, not her real name, describes what might happen to her if she returns to Afghanistan. If we go back to Afghanistan, we will be killed by Taliban or we will be present. There is not any, any human rights agencies, there is not any UN agencies or there is not any United Nations to hear us. Today we made a protest in Islamabad at least to raise our voices. When I moved here before my coming in Pakistan on December 2021, Taliban, they wanted to kidnap my 11-year-old son. And this is somehow that this is a very difficult option, not just for me, even for my family, for my kids, that if we go back there, the whole family life would be in danger. Our South Asia regional editor, Ambrasa Netarajan, explained why after decades of hosting Afghan refugees, the Pakistani government was doing this now. The relations between the uh, Pakistani government and the Afghan Taliban have worsened in recent months after a series of attacks on Pakistani security forces by Pakistani Taliban militants. Now, one of the reasons given by the government was that they, if they look at the number of suicide attacks in the country out of 24 According to the Pakistani authorities, nearly 14 were involving Afghan nationals. So that was one of the reasons why they were pointing out about why uh, they have taken this decision, asking all undocumented um, migrants, not only Afghans, they say, but then most of them are Afghan nationals. And it is estimated to be about 1.7 million people. Yes, a a huge number of Afghans because Pakistan has for decades welcomed people fleeing from the wars in Afghanistan. Uh, So this this is going to be a huge operation taking these people back. Tens of thousands of people have sought refuge in Pakistan. Many of them have married people in Pakistan. They've set up business. Some have their kids. They're born and brought up in Pakistan in the last 20 or 30 years. But many of them could not get their documents. It takes time to get your documents. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes months. Now, the Pakistani authorities are insisting that they are focusing only on those undocumented. And that this has created panic among many of these uh, people. As we speak, thousands of people are rushing to the border because the government has asked them to leave voluntarily up to the 1st of November. And then they say they would start the crackdown. And many Afghan agencies, they say that already hundreds of people have been rounded up by police. So people are now trying to wind up their businesses. And they are complaining because the situation in Afghanistan is not conducive for a business. And you're going to live under the Taliban administration. So they are now caught in between the situation of, you know, where to go, where we are going from Pakistan to Afghanistan. But many people are making this choice to go back to the country. But a very difficult choice, especially for women and and for families with with girls. Yes, those who have been uh, studying in Pakistan. So what kind of schools they're going to have back in Afghanistan? As you know, the Taliban have banned most of the education for girls, especially from secondary school onwards. So it is going to be a challenge. One, two, women can work in Pakistan. They can even do business. But when they go into Afghanistan, what kind of opportunities are there? Because the Taliban have shut most of the job opportunities, except for certain fields for women. Ambrasan Etirajan. An official inquiry into the COVID pandemic in the UK has heard a claim that the then Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, believed older people should accept their fate so the young could boost the economy. The statement came from the diary of the former Chief Scientific Advisor, Patrick Vallance. Two of the former Prime Minister's top aides have also been giving evidence. One of them, the former Downing Street Director of Communications, Lee Kane, said Mr Johnson didn't have the right abilities to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. It was the wrong crisis for this Prime Minister's skill set, which is different, I think, from not potentially being up to the job of being Prime Minister. I think if you look at something like COVID, you need quick, 
decisions and you need people to hold the course and you know have that strength of mind to do that over a sustained period of time so I felt it was the wrong challenge for him mostly. The former Prime Minister's chief advisor Dominic Cummings was asked why Mr Johnson hadn't been told of the growing crisis when he was on holiday in mid-February 2020, a time when many other countries were realising and responding to the scale of the public health emergency. I did not regard, and neither did other people, um, we did not think that asking the PM to come back and talk to COBRA or, or Whitehall in general at that point would have been productive. In fact, I thought it would have been counterproductive because I thought he would have said to everybody what he thought at the time, which was, this is another swine flu, it's all another rubbish media hoax, It'll, nothing will happen, blah, 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 blah. The real danger is the economy getting talked into a slump. Our political editor, Chris Mason, gave us this analysis of the inquiry so far. The overriding impression of what we're seeing at the COVID inquiry this week is one of dysfunction. Claims of a shambles at the heart of government. At just the moment, government was more important to more people than it had been for decades and decades. This inquiry matters because accountability matters. It matters so lessons can be learnt, given the number of dead for a start. And it matters too for the reputations of a former Prime Minister and the current one. Boris Johnson's character is being routinely and consistently trashed by those who worked most closely with him. Mr Johnson and his successor but one Rishi Sunak will also give evidence. The dredging up of Mr Sunak's decisions then, still with the capacity to contribute to his political fortunes now. Chris Mason. King Charles has told an audience in Kenya that there's no excuse for the atrocities committed by the British authorities during the colonial era. The king is on a state visit at a time when the UK is keen to improve ties with Kenya. But the king did not formally apologise for past abuses, a gesture many activists have demanded. An estimated 10,000 people were killed during Kenya's fight for independence. From Nairobi, our Royal Correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, sent this report. At the Presidential Palace in Nairobi, a ceremonial welcome and 21-gun salute for King Charles and Queen Camilla at the start of this state visit. The King then laid a wreath at the tomb of the unknown warrior in Uhuru Gardens. It was here, 70 years ago, that the British authorities set up a camp where they detained some of those involved in an uprising against colonial rule known as the Mau Mau Rebellion. The uprising was led largely by members of the Kikuyu tribe, many of whom had been displaced from their land. There were atrocities on both sides, but the uprising was crushed with great brutality. Mau Mau suspects were tortured, some were castrated, more than a thousand were executed. Tonight, in Nairobi's State House, the former seat of the British colonial governors, King Charles has addressed a state banquet and acknowledged the pain felt by many Kenyans during the uprising. He spoke with feeling, he expressed sorrow and regret, but stopped short of offering an apology. The wrongdoings of the past are a cause of the greatest sorrow and the deepest regret. There were abhorrent and unjustifiable acts of violence committed against Kenyans as they waged a painful struggle for independence and sovereignty. And for that, there can be no excuse. As King, Charles must reflect the British government's policy. Ten years ago, it offered £20 million in compensation for the handling of the Mau Mau uprising, But there is a strong feeling that an apology cannot be made for actions for which the present generation was not responsible. The palace will be hoping tonight's remarks will draw a line under the matter. Both governments are keen to look to the future. Nicholas Witchell. Following in the footsteps of Qatar, it now looks as if Saudi Arabia will host the Men's Football World Cup in 2034 after Australia decided not to bid for the event. No other countries had shown interest in staging the tournament ahead of the FIFA deadline on Tuesday. Our sports editor, Dan Roan, says there are conflicting views about whether Saudi Arabia, which just a few years ago was being called a pariah for its part in the gruesome murder of a journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, is a suitable host. 
If you thought the Winter World Cup in Qatar was a one-off, then think again. Less than a year since the Middle East staged football showpiece event for the first time, it's emerged neighbouring Saudi Arabia is set to play host in 2034. Once again, extreme heat is likely to make the traditional summer slot impossible, but Eddie Howe, the manager of Saudi-owned Newcastle United, has given the prospect his backing. I think that the, our trips out there have been... Uh, to two different places. Wherever we went was really well organised and we were well looked after. So I, I think if that's a, a sign of what a World Cup might look like, then I think you can be rest assured that everything will be structurally really good. With FIFA's president Gianni Infantino known to be close to the Saudi crown prince, the governing body appeared to pave the way for the Gulf Kingdom by limiting possible bidders and fast-tracking the process. Saudi Arabia, just like Qatar, is facing criticism over its human rights record. Steve Coburn is from Amnesty International. Migrant workers are regularly exploited. Those are the the migrant workers that would end up building the stadiums and the other infrastructure. We know that anyone who criticises the regime is, is imprisoned. And we know that communities are discriminated against. So there are huge, huge risks in doing this tournament. In recent years, the Saudi government has invested billions of pounds into a range of sports, from football and golf to boxing and Formula One, insisting the unprecedented spending is about modernising the kingdom, diversifying its economy and inspiring its people. But with the World Cup itself now on the horizon, the accusations of sports washing will only intensify. Dan Rohn. Here in Britain, the way you speak has traditionally been seen as clear proof of your class and background. Now there's new evidence that the Cockney accent spoken in working class parts of London and the plummy tones of the English upper classes are in decline. Researchers analysed the voices of nearly 200 young people from across South East England and London and grouped them together by how they pronounced vowels. Three new accent categories have emerged, which the researchers say are due to the increased movement of people, the spread of universal education, and a growing emphasis on a so-called correct way of speaking. Our correspondent, Zoe Conway, has been taking a listen. Researchers at the University of Essex found that the accent is dying out among young people. 